It's a huge pleasure to, to introduce uh, Kevin Otterson. Um, Kevin is a professor of law, at the, and the, he's the N. Neil Pike Scholar of Health and Disability Law at Boston U. Uh, Kevin is, is broadly interested in, uh, in global health, but he's, he's extremely well known in these circles, um, uh, the subject of today, uh, as the executive director and principal investigator of CARBEX, um, yet another acronym. Um, this is an international public-private partnership uh, that's aimed at accelerating uh, innovation in antibiotic uh, drug discovery. He, uh, I mean, Ke Kevin is simply rock star status in, in this field um, of, of antibiotic innovation where, you know, he's focusing on economic and policy measures that are required to fix a broken business model associated with AMR. Um, he was uh, a, just a no-brainer. Uh, invite for uh, for today. He he walks in 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 many circles, but it never ceases to amaze me uh, how at home he is talking science. Uh, he's obviously a law professor, uh, you know, with with nerds like like me uh, and others. So uh, his 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 efforts in the M AMR world are are in that context. I think just really spectacular. Uh, he's a he's a fearless example of. Uh, of interdisciplinary leadership uh, in, in in actually all the focus areas for the uh, for the symposium today. So, Kevin, I'm so so glad you could you could be here. Yeah, thank you for that uh, too generous inter introduction. I appreciate you know Eric and and Jerry and uh, where's Lori? You know, and all the the Global Nexus and McMaster team. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Christine and I, during the break, were thinking, we need to know something more about the audience, okay? So how many of you are like, would classify yourself as a bench scientist sort of person? Okay, um, most of you, okay. How many of you consider yourself like a social scientist, non-bench scientist? Okay, you gotta really wave your hand because there's only like three or four of us. Five, six, okay, small number. And, uh, and how many of you are, didn't realize what you were wandering into and, and you're neither of these categories because you just came for the free snack? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, there, there we go. So, um, so I'm, I'm here today to, to talk about something new. I'm, I'm not going to talk about my own uh, research and business models or, or the article that Christine put up that actually Christine and myself and Mohammed are, are co-authors on, but to talk about something that's entirely new in the world. This is the Independent Panel on Evidence for Action uh, for AMR. This is a, a, an idea that is in germination. It's, it sits with the, it, it came from the Global Leaders Group on AMR. Uh, you know, heads of state um, and, and, you know, serious global health leaders came up with this idea. Dame Sally Davies of the United Kingdom, I think, was behind it. Uh, it's been given to the Secretary General of the United Nations, and, and, and it's, it's formally held there. And then they're working with the quadripartite, you know, so, you know, the, the agencies of the, of, the, uh, of the United Nations system, including the World Health Organization, uh, that are working on AMR issues on a One Health front. So this is an attempt uh, to recreate or to create something new in this space to move forward um, evidence for action. And so I wanted to talk about that today and to give a sense of some of the things that, uh, that are possible and some of the ways that your work uh, could be impacted or the ways that your work can actually shape uh, what may or may not happen uh, if IPEA goes forward from the idea stage to the actual reality. The analogy for IPEA is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the way that, that the IPCC over decades has shaped and, and guided and, and advanced the research on climate models, shouldn't we have something similar in the AMR world? That's the, the short version of it. So as, as Eric said, I lead CARBEX. Um, I'm not gonna talk about CARBEX today, uh, but we, have, we are grateful that $800 million has been given to us to, to charitably uh, deliver to small product developers that take ideas from the university stage uh, to the end of first and human. Uh, these are the funders. Uh, I'm not speaking on their behalf. This is Professor Kevin Alderson, not Carbex, talking to you today. These are the three topics I'm going to cover. Think, thinking about ecology, uh, uh, talking about law and economics, which is really the field that I work in, uh, or the subdiscipline within uh, law that I work in, and then a little bit about uh, the design possibilities for IPEA. And every time I type IPEA, I worry that I've somehow 
misspelled it, and it really should be IKEA. Uh, but this is a, a different organization, and first I'll start with ecology. So, you know, you probably are aware of this, but, you know, wolves were, you know, eradicated, extinct from, from the Yellowstone area because cattle ranchers did not appreciate wolves eating into their profits, into their animals. And so, complete eradication uh, more than a century ago. And then there was a reintroduction over some protest from local ranchers of wolves into Yellowstone. There was an anticipation that this was going to cut back on the deer population. So that was kind of the level of hypothesis. What they weren't um, you know, expecting was all the other ecological things that, that flowed from that. So yes, the deer population was reduced as the, as the wolves were reestablished. The deer then relocated away from the areas in which the wolves were, were more prevalent. Um, because the deer were no longer in those areas, trees were able to grow, different plants were able to grow, new birds uh, appeared in those areas, and some of those trees were able to, to grow to you know, bigger maturity. It not only affected uh, the animals and the birds and the trees, but the, the trees growing up actually affected the, the flow and the course of rivers because now soil erosion was different. So the, the point here is that ecology is really complex. And when you mess with an ecological system, when you intervene in it, expect unexpected consequences of, of massive proportion. Um, when you think about resistance, so this is a, you know, I could have started with the first slide just talking about resistance in a single individual, uh, but this is like in a hospital ward. And, and you think of certain wards and places of the hospital in which antibiotics are being used, uh, and then other places in which, uh, you know, people are being transferred. Uh, when they've done some of these studies within hospitals, they've done metagenomic studies and been able to actually trace, you know, this patient infected this other patient or this patient, these three patients all got a similar uh, you know, hospital-associated bacterial infection because they've all visited uh, the scanning um, machinery, you know, in the basement, which, which turns out they weren't cleaning quickly enough. So the point is that there's a lot of movement of bacteria and people within a single hospital. Even when you build a brand new hospital, it might be pristine on the day that you put it up, uh, but very shortly when you put humans in it, uh, it becomes recolonized with all sorts of bacteria. And studies looking at how these things interact at a facility level are, are really quite interesting uh, and helps you to understand what's going on in the sing inside of a single hospital, okay? But that is not sufficient. You need to think not just about the hospital, but the network in which the hospital sits. And so Susan Huang and, and, uh, and, and, and Bruce Lee and, and, and many others have done these, these regional studies. I think Susan's work uh, in Orange County, you know, they got all 31 healthcare you know, uh, facilities within Orange County, California, the, the long-term care facility, the hospitals, the, the hospice, everything, um, and, and mapped the transmission, the movement of patients with uh, drug-resistant infections between these hospitals. And, and so, you know, this, this actual uh, graphic is from the CDC uh, Antimicrobial Threats Report, uh, not from uh, Susan or Bruce's uh, work, but, but you get the sense that, you know, it's not just a hospital facility or an individual, it, there's also a regional aspect to this. There, there's a, a flow you know, and an ecology and a system. And so if you make a perpetration, if you, if, if you intervene in one of these places, uh, say, you know, a nursing home and try to do something, but don't change the rest of the system, right? Then you, you've, you're not going to get the same consequences that you're hopeful for. And you might end up in something like Yellowstone, in which you change something and you're not aware of the other downstream or sidestream effects that may occur. So, you know, we do understand, you know, certain things uh, within these systems, especially uh, ideas like let's decolonize people that are leaving the nursing home to go to the hospital uh, for some surgical procedure. Let's do some decolonization so that you know, their, their risk of infection would be lower, or, or on the transfer back from the hospital back to the nursing home, we don't want to infect other nursing home residents. That's the level that the work is on. But there's a lot more complexity underneath that that's possible to explore. This is, uh, you know, some simple graphics on climate models. And, and uh, on the left, it's just all sorts of inputs and, and processes that, that affect climate. So, and, and a lot of these have, uh, you, know, you know, over time, 
uh, climate scientists have been able to identify most of the major systems, or maybe all of the major systems. And over time, they've tried to identify you know, the relationship between them. So if, you know, if, uh, if ocean temperature rises, that's bad, right? But that also will increase perhaps plankton growth. And, and, and so there's a feedback loop in which you know, other things can be happening that might mitigate some of the effects. And some of these effects are nonlinear, which we're going to see when the Greenland ice sheet or, or, the, or the large ice sheets in Antarctica uh, melt and fall off. There'll be a nonlinear sort of tipping point effect. Uh, my point is that they've been at this for decades, um, understanding the major interactions in the system on a planetary basis. And that's, that slide on the right, you know, the climate models actually slice up the atmosphere and, and, and the oceans not just into you know, two dimensions, but three dimensions, and, and, and model the effects globally on the, on the whole thing. You know, it's a very complex model that's being developed over decades. And this is what we should aspire to, thinking about what is the model for one health or microbial ecology for the planet? Not just individuals, not just things in a petri dish, not just hospitals or regional hospital systems, but a planetary system which includes all of the things that we use for agriculture, everything that we do in terms of runoff and, and, and waste. Uh, it, can we build this model? Can we understand what we're doing so that we can intervene better? Uh, that, in my mind, is the goal of, of IPEA and what we can uh, try to look for. And so this is a, you know, a simplistic uh, drawing, uh, actually done by undergraduate students. Um, but uh, you, know, you get the sense that we have some idea of the major systems. But really, I can tell you that we don't have any sort of uh, confidence that all the major systems are represented on, on such a diagram. Uh, we might have a sense of the directionality of the effect. You know, so greater use of, of antimicrobials in agriculture increases resistance, you know, not the other way around. We know the directionality of the effect. What we don't understand is, is the strength of that effect. You know, if you're going to build a mathematical model, we have no idea what the actual parameter values are. They do for climate change. We don't know that uh, for the global One Health uh, you know, AMR sort of model. And so the question at the bottom there, where is the most cost-effective place to spend the next whatever, $1 billion, $10 billion in the, around the planet? It might be that the best place to spend that is not on new drugs, which is what Carbex does, but maybe on toilets and sanitation and fresh water, you know, clean water in places like, like India or Pakistan, right? Uh, it, that might be the answer. We don't know. We cannot model at this point uh, where the most cost-effective interventions might be. So ecology is important. It's complex. Uh, I, I suspect that there's so much we don't understand of the human interactions with the microbial ecology at this point. We need a couple decades to, to get that going. The good news, if you're interested in that, is that so are the leaders of the world, and they're trying to stand up this IPEA uh, to make that a priority and, and build research agendas for the next couple of decades. Okay. Second topic, I work in, in law and economics, or economics law, I'm going to talk a little bit about how some social science perspectives might also be on this agenda. I'm just going to give a little sample. Uh, if you want more, we actually had a, a conference in Copenhagen uh, last week. Uh, there's a group called the International uh, Enamorous uh, that uh, is, is co-led by several of us. And it, basically social scientists, uh, historians, ethicists, uh, you know, anthropologists, lawyers, economists who care about these issues looking at ways that, in which we can help uh, because AMR is a social human problem as well as, uh, as everything else, as well as it being a, be a bench and lab science issue. So I want to say, first of all, that you read in some publications a description that AMR um, you know, is a, or that you know, antimicrobials or antibiotics are a global public good, right? And, and I suggest that from an economic standpoint, that's wrong. Uh, you know, they, they don't have the actual characteristics of global public goods. It's an aspirational statement as opposed to, or a political statement, as opposed to an actual descriptive, uh, correct uh, you know, d description of what these things are. Uh, so they, the antimicrobials themselves, uh, they're rivalrous. If, if, if I take a pill, you can't have it. And if I take a pill, it slightly diminishes, we don't know by how much, 
the pill you're going to take next tomorrow or the next week or the next year. So, so the consumption of these things are, are not, they're, they're rival risks, which makes it not a, a, global common, a global public good. But we can think about this as a rich literature and common pool resources. Right? And you can think of a fishery, a pond, or, or an offshore fishery that's managed either through cooperation or by law or by both um, in a way to, to make it sustainable. Okay, so the first thing you do is control withdrawals, right? Translated into this world, it's antimicrobial stewardship. Let's be careful about how we use these. Let's control the number of fish we take out. Let's, let's be careful about the number of antibiotics we use and therefore the, the diminished effectiveness that we impose on the rest of society. So stewardship can be thought of as that sort of a management strategy. You also need sustainability. You need to worry about the water quality going in, the pollution uh, in the pond or, or the fishery. Uh, so there's, there's one health sustainability issues there. And then, of course, you know, you may want to restock the pond or do something affirmative uh, to create more fish. This is not a fixed finite resource. It's potentially or partially renewable. And, and antibiotics are that as well. If we continue the basic research, which are really, you have a, an amazing group here. I don't think you understand uh, how poorly resourced the world is in basic antibiotic R&D, and, and the resources that you have here are really tremendous. But, but that, you know, the, the tax of, of bringing new antibiotics to market, doing that research, can be analogized to restocking the pond, right? So that we have future supply uh, of, of what we need, effective antibacterials. Uh, there's a rich uh, theoretical and empirical literature in this, uh, and, and people have won, you know, there's been a Nobel prize in economics given on the basis of the management of common pool resources. So there's a lot to be learned from these, these folks. The second, uh, you know, that was economics and then talking a little bit about law. Th this is really reflects a lot of my work and these two columns are, are you know, the first one uh, talks about demand, so stewardship. You know, how do we regulate demand? How do we manage the resource? And, and the far column on the right under supply is how do we create new ones? And then the rows are legal techniques. You know, how does the law approach this? Because my hypothesis of my work is that the law is an actor. Uh, the law is a lever uh, that can influence, for good or for bad, how antimicrobials are useful in society, whether they achieve the goal of actually helping people or not. And so you can see several of these, and I'm not going to talk about many of them, but on the, that top row, uh, you know, if, if you want to do something about the common pool management, if you want to manage that common pool resource, uh, one idea is to enclose it, to privatize it, right? That is what intellectual property law, IP law, does. It takes what, what is, would ordinarily be, uh, you know, a resource that's not appropriable that everyone can use, appropriable by anyone, and, and turns it into something that for a limited time is only usable by the, the IP rights holder. You know, that is exactly what's going on in, in that quadrant, you know, that upper right traditional IP theory piece. But uh, that's not the only tool in the toolbox. There's seven others. And uh, when I first you know, created this chart, I have to say that third row, contract, uh, we didn't really have very many examples of, of doing that. And really, today, the discussions uh, with a, a subscription model for antimicrobial reimbursement in England is the first you know, national level example of this going well. And what Christine Ardahl just presented on, on Scandinavian countries uh, doing a different procurement model for generic antibiotics also fits into this. We're going to ensure the supply as well as ensuring uh, the sustainability of these drugs uh, by contract, by paying a little more uh, for them. The Pasteur Act in the United States, uh, discussions in many G7 countries about how to reform reimbursement for antibiotics fits into that row. And then there's others, which, uh, you know, there's articles that various people have written in, in each of these boxes. Uh, the, most, uh, the most recent salient thing in, in my mind here that we really need to think about more is that tort waivers box on the bottom row. And uh, that was true for some but not all of the COVID vaccines. Uh, the manufacturers uh, demanded out of countries like the United States uh, a tort waiver. So if, if, uh, if you believe the, some social media that... Uh, the vaccine is going to cause horrible things to you. Uh, if you take the vaccine in the United States, you're not going to be able to sue in a, in a court. 
You know, there, there's a special process set up for vaccine compensation, but the right to sue was taken away. The government waived it on behalf of the whole population as part of the contract to get the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines to the people quickly. That was not true in every country. So it's an interesting opportunity to study. You know, you know we have a discontinuity. Some countries tore away, some others. Did it help? Did, did it speed innovation? Uh, or is it just a gift, you know, a, a windfall uh, to the companies? So lots of work going on in this area. I'm not going to, you know, spend too much more time. Uh, moving on to a, a final analogy in this law and economics section, which is infrastructure. And uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, the first talk, <laughs> We did not coordinate this, but my next three slides are on water pipes and, and, and water quality. Uh, so a happy coincidence. But uh, this is my street where I live in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, I live in a beautiful 120-year-old home. Um, the, that's the good news. The bad news is that the water pipes are 120 years old, uh, and they had a, a projected useful life of, of 100 years. And so the water pipes need to be replaced. Okay. And so these guys, um, between their mini Dunkin' Donuts break, and Dunkin' Donuts is like the Tim Hortons of, of, of Boston, uh, but during their, their breaks, you know, they actually occasionally dig in the street and, and, and eventually uh, will replace these pipes uh, very slowly. Um, but uh, so, you know, we're actually hopeful that our, our street will be fully paved and ready by spring, but no earlier. It's going to take a long time. But... Um, these guys don't just randomly wake up and decide, I'm going to, to dig up Westwood Road today. Now, they have a plan, and, and the plan probably stretches it to years. They know when the various pipes were laid, how old they are. Uh, they know which pipes are failing and which pipes are doing okay. Uh, they, they make prioritization. They have a master plan for this stuff, and, uh, and they execute on that master plan. They don't wake up in the morning and say, well, we're going to dig up these pipes. How are we going to pay for this piece of equipment and all these people. No, uh, they have long-term financing. The, the city sells bonds. And over the next 40 years, uh, the people who use the water are going to pay for the fact that there's new water pipes, right? So there's a master plan. Uh, it's it, because we know that this infrastructure is important. Uh, I would hate to live in a place that had bad water. There are cities in the United States that have terrible water um, that, that can't be used safely, Flint, Michigan, Jackson, Mississippi, which was mentioned. And we don't want that, you know, because water is, is essential uh, for public health. Uh, so we have a plan for this stuff when it's infrastructure that's a public utility that's useful. Antibiotics are infrastructure that also require maintenance, okay? Most important drug class in human history in terms of impact, positive impact on human health. It's an off-balance sheet asset for civilization that nobody is tracking, nobody is taking care of, nobody is maintaining it, nobody has a long-term plan. So, you know, Christine put up the slide of the four antibiotics that are most used uh, in, in various low-income countries. Maybe those are actually the wrong antibiotics to be used, but still, these are the ones that are being used. Nobody is planning on how to replace those antibiotics when they inevitably give, give way to resistance. I can assure you, nobody has made that plan at this point. And so no one has responsibility for an extremely valuable, key, critical global health asset. And, uh, and it's not being tracked, it's not being performed, it's not being financed. There is no long-term plan. This is something IPEA could help to do, right? So one way to do the changed plan is to change the way we pay for antibiotics. You know, the, the WHO classifies most new antibiotics as reserve which I have here behind glass, which is great uh, for public health purposes. We don't need to use the federal call very much right now. We'd prefer to save it for five or 10 or 20 years later when we might need it more. So that's great for health and, and medicine and whatnot. It's terrible for the company who spent 10 to 15 years bringing this thing to market and the people in labs like yours spent another five or 10 years you know, working on it before that. And then eventually it finally gets to FDA approval and are there sales? Not many because it's behind glass, it's reserve. Okay? So the changing the way we pay for antibiotics is the idea of let's pay for the uh, accessibility or, or the, the subscription to these antibiotics, the availability of them, not necessarily the volume of use. The fire extinguisher equipment in the, in the, embedded in the ceiling of this room, those people were paid on the day that it was installed. The manufacturers of the, of the, of the metal and, and, the, and the people who came here to install it, uh, they've been paid years ago. However old this building was, uh, they got paid. 
You don't wait until the fire starts to pay them, right? With antibiotics, you know, they, they are preparedness defense device, in addition to small uses in, in the first couple of years, they're really a preparedness, uh, you know, tool uh, for future years. And we need ways to ensure the companies don't go bankrupt uh, when they deliver this. Uh, and the way that we ensure the fire extinguisher people don't get bankrupt is we, we buy the thing and set it on the shelf waiting for the day that we might need it. So the solution there is to, to pay in advance for preparedness, for protection, uh, through antibacterial push and pull incentives. Carbex is an antibacterial push incentive. Pull incentives are things like what the United Kingdom is doing through a subscription program, what the G7 is exploring um, you know, uh, you know, in the last uh, health minister's declaration in June, and, and what the United States is looking at with, um, with the Pastor Act. Okay. Deep breath. Okay. Um, IPEA. What, what can we learn from some of what I've said about how are we doing, how we, how we can design IPEA? So IPEA, you know, this is, a, this is my vision. This is not, you know, the way that, 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 uh, that the quadripartite uh, group is necessarily articulating it. But what we want is to improve, uh, you know, this one health concept, not just human health, but, but animals and, and veterinary and agricultural uses and environmental things as well. We want to improve our interaction the human uh, interaction and animal interaction, the environmental interaction with the microbial world, okay? And so the strategy is that we need science, we need data, so that we understand this, this whole ecosystem better. Uh, and this will take decades. Uh, not only the ecosystem itself, but our role, how humans intervene in this for good or for ill. And then this data can be mobilized so that we can actually create helpful interventions and stop unhelpful interventions. An unhelpful intervention, an example of that would be a lot of antibiotics are fermented and, 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 and after the, the process is complete, in, in a country like India, historically, they would just drain the 10,000 gallon stainless steel tanks into the local river, uh, releasing all sorts of antibacterial material into the river. That is probably an unhelpful activity, right? And we're recognizing it. We don't know how bad it is, but we know it can't be good. It would be nice to have data to prioritize the things that we can intervene on that are helpful and to stop doing some of the things that we can identify as being dangerous and then achieve these goals with, with additional concern about things like, like equity you know, and sustainability. You know, in this whole area, humans have lacked humility and humanity. Uh, we've lacked humility because we've marched in and, and perturbed with a complex ecological system without even knowing what we were doing. And we lacked humanity because today, you know, we have these, these wonderful drugs and we still have millions of people around the world who are dying because they can't get access to them. So, so we, need, we can do better and, and uh, you know, it's our nerdy hope that, uh, that, that we could do better with data, with science, uh, imagine that. And, and even be able to mo motivate and mobilize politically uh, based on that. So the goal is then to take this information that's developed over decades to design and implement a global, a global legal and social architecture to support uh, these interventions, to actually improve what we're doing. So it's similar to what they're trying to do with climate change, but our problem is actually solvable um, on, a, on a reasonable budget. You know, Christina and I were talking about at breakfast, you know, unlike climate change, which has fossil fuel companies who are fighting to the death against the idea, there's nobody fighting for more AMR resistance that I'm aware of. <laughs> and this is a problem that's solvable uh, for, you know, uh, certainly tens of billions of dollars, not trillions of dollars. So I think of this as a test for civilization. If we can't solve this common pool resource management problem, then, then bad for us, right? And if we can solve this, then we can go on to solving more complex and difficult problems in the future. So it's called the Independent Panel, and I want to focus a little bit on the word independent. And the IPCC for, for climate change, the I doesn't stand for independent, it stands for intergovernmental. It's run by governments, right? And so what are good examples of, of things that are really independent in science? You know? So here are some examples on them, and HH is Howard Hughes. Uh, investigators, you know, these are, these are ideas that, that give money to, to trusted researchers and then let them kind of direct what's going on. That's scientific independence with, with, 
with some parameters around it, of course. And characteristics of it, you know, very light or no touch uh, from program officers. You're not being micromanaged by some government uh, office. Um, little or no steerage on what exactly happens next, right? You write in your R01 what you're going to do, and then there's what you actually do in the next five years, right? Um, and uh, trust is built either on your past record or the fact that you're a repeat player, so you know that if, if you blow, if you don't do anything with that first five years of the R01, you ain't getting another one, right? So the trust is based on repeat player or your past record or the structure of the program, and, and that's how DARPA works. And, the U.S. just stood up a new agency, uh, swore in the, the, the new leader of uh, ARPA-H, which takes the DARPA model and moves it over to health research. So I think independence is important here, and I, and I worry about a system that's, that's directed by governments or by the World Health Organization, by some sort of a scientific consensus. It might lack the independence that we really may want. The second word I have trouble with is the word panel, right? Because uh, do we really want a panel? You know, because the panel sounds like experts with gray hair saying yes or no to certain things. And, and, and that concerns me. Um, there are some examples of, of panel sort of architecture uh, throughout science and science funding. Um, but you have to worry about, you know, the, the characteristics, the negative characteristics, the biases, uh, the fact that they can be captured. Uh, they can, the people there can have unfavorable opinions of, of outliers and people outside of their networks. And all of that might bias, and we won't get this, the quality of science uh, for the amount of money that we're talking about um, as quickly and as, as purely as we could otherwise. And then finally, evidence for action. So what, is, what we need to do is to first map what we know and don't know in this world. You know, it would be nice to understand what the major components of the, of the One Health Global Microbial uh, Model would be. Maybe it's the ones on that slide from the undergraduate students, maybe there's others and begin to prioritize understanding which major pieces are the most open, most unknown, where, where the activity needs to be the greatest, that mapping exercise would be helpful. Because not only would it send a signal to you as a young researcher, hopefully it sends a signal to the science funders, to the NIH, to the national science uh, you know, funders in every country, uh, helping them to prioritize. So instead of a scattershot of things, uh, there's actually some uh, move towards funding things that are, that are the most unknown, or the, the biggest gaps, uh, the highest impact areas uh, that, we could, that we could possibly fund towards. And, and that might eventually get us to cost-effective and feasible solutions. And my question on the bottom is that, does any of this really require a significant structure, you know, uh, you know a secretary with hundreds of people and a big budget uh, at, at IPEA or the WHO or someplace else? And, and I hope the answer is no. All right. I hope the answer is that we could do something like up here with a very minimal bureaucracy. So think of this as the, 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 minimum, uh, in the, the minimum acceptable uh, functions in an IPEA uh, might be the things that I describe on this list. And these are all just my thoughts. You know, I, it, it's not by any means uh, representing what, what will actually happen. Um, but just something at, at the base level, maybe every two years at conference, that is an explicit goal of trying to build the One Health global model for antimicrobial, you know, for microbial life and, and human-animal agricultural interactions with that. Um, you'd, you'd want the conference to be designed in a way that wasn't a single group of gatekeepers. So, so maybe there's a, you know, three or four ways for, for you to get into such a thing. Because you want diversity of opinion, not just you know, five gray-haired men uh, you know, controlling the agenda of, of such conferences. There are giant global conferences, scientific conferences, in which they are controlled by a small group of people. Let's not repeat that sort of era. Uh, travel grants, you know, you know, if, if you want people to build a research base in, in Africa, in Southeast Asia, or you know, you know, other places of the world, you need to pay for them to come. Right? You, you can't expect them to scrape together money. And it needs to be more than just airfare and, and the hotel. It actually needs to be some, some money so that they can, they can prepare uh, their presentation and their slides and, and make sure that they have something uh, that's helpful. And, and I think of this more like a, you know, a Cochrane process. You know, of, of, there's a methodology uh, that we try to follow and we start to grade our evidence and assess it rather than what we have right now with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 
Um, I would propose no actual research funding through IPEA. You know, that it just be this scientific meeting that helps to shape the agenda, show the holes, and then national research funders actually make the decision, uh, which again shows some diversity. It's not just one group uh, making these decisions, but every country and every other uh, Gates and, and Welcome and, and, and others, uh, they can step in based on their assessment of the gaps and, and issue calls and, and fund research. And hopefully in this process, scientific independence is maintained. So that's what I have for you. I'm, I'm trying to, to help you understand what might be a structure that could have significant impact on the next 20 or 30 years of, of, of research funding in this area. Uh, it's still nascent. It's, it's not funded. It's not established. A lot of this is, is, uh, is still un, uh, undone. And it's still possible, I guess, that nothing happens with it. You know, lots of good ideas uh, go to the United Nations system, and, and there they die. All right, but this idea, I, I'm hopeful that it comes through and that it comes through in a way that maximizes the, the positive impact on, on all of the science that uh, all of you are doing. So thank you for your attention.